everybody, I hope you're doing well today. I'm just carrying on with where I left off at the beginning of the chapter called The Podcast of Revelations. So it's been a crazy year for you, Marcelio began, in his very good English. Oh yeah, it's been quite a ride, said Nora, trying to sound like a rock star. Now, if I may ask about the album, Pottersville, you wrote all the lyrics, yes? Mostly, yes, Nora guessed. Starring, staring at the small familiar mole on her left hand. She wrote all of them, interjected Joanna. Marcelio nodded while the other guy, still smiling toothily, fiddled about with some with sound levels via a laptop. I think Feathers is my favourite track, said Marcelio as the drinks arrived. I'm glad you like it. Nora tried to think of a way she could get out of this interview. A headache, a bad stomach. But the one I'd like to talk about first is the one you decided to release Stay Out of My Life. It seemed such a personal statement. Nora forced a smile. The lyrics say it all, really. Obviously, there has been some speculation about whether it refers to the, how do you say it in English? Restraining order? Offered Joanna helpfully. Yes, the restraining order. Um, Nora said, taken aback. Well, I prefer to get it all out in the song. I find that stuff difficult to talk about. Yes, I understand. It's just that in your recent Rolling Stone interview, you talked a little about your former boyfriend, Dan Lord, and mentioned how difficult it was to get the the, the restraining order against him after he stalked you. Didn't he try to break into your house? Then tell reporters that he wrote the lyrics for Beautiful Sky. Jesus. She hovered at the intersection of tears and laughter and managed somehow to give neither. I wrote it when I was still with him, but he didn't like it. He didn't like me being in this band. He hated it. He hated my brother, he hated Ravi, he hated Ella, who was one of the original members. Anyway, Dan was very jealous. This was so surreal. In one life, the life he had supposedly wanted, Dan was so bored in his marriage to Nora, he was having an affair, while in this life, he was breaking into her house because he couldn't stand her success. He's an awful man, said Nora. I don't know the Portuguese for swear words for a terrible person. Well, he was a cousin. He turned out to be someone else entirely. It's weird the way your life changes when people act in different ways. The price of fame, I suppose. And you wrote a song called Henry David Thoreau. You don't get many songs named after philosophers. I know, well, when I studied philosophy at university, he was my favourite, hence my tattoo, and it made it made a marginally better song title than Immanuel Kant. She was getting into the swing of it now. It wasn't too hard to act a life when it was the one she was destined for. And Howl, obviously, such a powerful song. Number one in 22 countries, Grammy award winning video with a Hollywood A-list cast. I suppose you're done talking about it. I suppose, yes. Joanna went to get herself another honey cake. Marcelio smiled gently as he pressed on. For me, it seemed so primal. The song, I mean. Like you were letting everything out. And then I discovered you wrote it on the very night you fired your last manager, before Joanna. After you found out he'd been ripping you off. Yeah, that wasn't good, she improvised. It was such a betrayal. I was a big Labyrinth fan before How, but that was the one for me. That and Lighthouse Girl. How was where I was like, Nora Seed is a genius. The lyrics are pretty abstract, but the way you just let out that rage was so soft and soulful and powerful all at once. It's like early cure fused with Frank Ocean via The Carpenters and Tame Impala. Nora tried and failed to imagine what that could possibly sound like. He started to sing to everyone's surprise. Silence the music to improve the tune. Stop the fake smiles and howl at the moon. Nora smiled and nodded, as if she knew these lyrics. Yeah, yeah, I was just howling. Marcelio's face became serious. He seemed genuinely concerned for her. You've had so much stuff to deal with these last few years. Stalkers, bad managers, the fake feuds, the court case, the copyright issues, the messy breakup with Ryan Bailey, the reception of the last album, Rehab, that incident in Toronto. That time you collapsed from exhaustion in Paris, personal tragedy, drama, 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 and all that media intrusion. Why do you think the press hate you so much? Nora began to feel a bit queasy. Was this what fame was? 
like a permanent bittersweet cocktail of worship and assault. It was no wonder so many famous people went off the rails when the rails veered in every direction. It was like being slapped and kissed at the same time. I, I don't know. It's pretty crackers. I mean, do you ever wonder what your life would have been like if you had decided to take a different path? Nora listened to this as she stared at the bubble, bubbles rising in her mineral water. I think it's easy to imagine there are easier paths, she said, realising something for the first time. Maybe there are no easy paths, there are just paths. In one life I might be married, in another I might be working in a shop. I might have said yes to this cute guy who asked me out for a coffee. In another I might be, a research I might be researching glaciers in the Arctic Circle. In another I might be an Olympic swimming champion. Who knows? Every second of every day we are entering a new universe. We spend so much time wishing our lives were different, comparing ourselves to other people and to other versions of ourselves, when really most lives contain degrees of good and degrees of bad. Marcelio and Joanna and the other Brazilian guy were staring at her wide-eyed, but she was on a roll now, freewheeling. There are patterns to life, rhythms. It's so easy, while trapped in just the one life, to imagine that times of sadness or tragedy or failure or fear are a result of that particular existence, that it is a byproduct of living a certain way rather than simply living. I mean, it would have made things a lot easier if we understood there was no way of living that can immunise you against sadness. And that sadness is in trin intrinsically part of the fabric of happiness. You can't have one without the other. Of course, they come in different degrees and quantities, but there is no life where you can be in a state of sheer happiness forever. And imagining there is just breeds more, there just breeds more unhappiness in the life you're in. That is a great answer, Marcelo said, after he was sure she had finished. But tonight I would say at the concert you seemed happy, when you played bridge over troubled water instead of how. That was such a powerful statement. It was saying, I am strong. It felt like you were telling us, your fans, that you were okay. And so, how was touring going? Well, it's great. And yes, I thought I'd send a message that, you know, I'm out here living my best life. But I miss home after a while. Which one? Asked Marcelio with a quietly cheeky smile. I mean, do you feel more at home in London or LA or the Amalfi Coast? It seemed like this was the life where her carbon footprint was the highest. I don't know. I suppose I would say London. Marcelo took a sharp intake of breath as if the next, next question was something he had to swim under. He scratched his beard. Okay, but I suppose it must be hard for you, as I know you shared that flat with your brother. Why would it be hard? Joanna gave her a curious glance from above her cocktail. Marcelio looked at her with sentimental fondness. His eyes seemed glazed. I mean, he went on after a delicate sip of beer. Your brother was such a big part of your life, such a big part of the band. Was. So much dread in such a small world, like a stone falling through water. She remembered asking Ravi about her brother before the encore. He's still around. He was here tonight. She means she feels him, said Joanna. They all feel him. He was such a strong spirit. Troubled, but strong. It was a tragedy how the drink and the drugs and the whole life got him in the end. What are you talking about? Nora asked. She was no longer acting alive. She genuinely needed to know. Marcelo looked sad for her. You know, it's only been two years since his death. His overdose. Nora gasped. She didn't arrive back in the Midnight Library instantly because she hadn't absor absorbed it. She stood up, dazed, and staggered out of the suite. Nora, laughed Joanna nervously. Nora! She got in the lift and went down to the bar to Ravi. You said Joe was schmoozing the media. What? You asked. You, you said. I asked what Joe was doing and you said schmoozing the media. He put his beer down and stared at her like a riddle. And I was right. He was schmoozing the media. She... He pointed over to Joanna, who was looking aghast as she headed over from the lifts in the lobby. Yeah, Joe. She was with the press, and Nora felt the sadness like a punch. Oh no, she said. Oh, Joe. Oh, Joe. Oh. And the Grand Hotel bar disappeared. The table, the drinks, Joanna, Marcelio, the sound guy, the hotel guests, Ravi, the others, the marble floor, the barman, the waiters, the chandeliers, the flowers, all became nothing at all. Okay, everybody, that is all I'm reading today. 
um we just got to the end of a the chapter there so i'll be carrying on with a new one in the next episode bye <laughs>